Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Jones, and I am our customer services librarian for the Souk and Port Renfrew branches of Vancouver Island Regional Library. Um, today, I just want to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of each of the communities in our service area, and also those represented by those in attendance at today's virtual program. I'm personally coming to you from Esquimalt and Songhees Nations, and I'm fortunate enough to work on Souk Nation, all of whose relationships um, with the land continue to this day. And um, of course, I'm sure as you guys all know, today we're going to be speaking with author Michael Christie. Um, he's the author of our One Book, One Community Greenwood book. Uh, he's also a former professional skateboarder. Um, he's worked as a carpenter and homeless shelter worker. And he's also written If I Fall, If I Die, The Beggar's Garden, and of course, Greenwood. He's been nominated for numerous awards, including the Scotiabank Giller Prize, the Kirkus Prize, the International IMPAC Dublin Literary Award, Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, the BC Book Awards, the Evergreen Award, and he's been on numerous best book lists and won the Vancouver Book Award, Northern Lit Award, and recently the 2020 Arthur Ellis Award for Greenwood. He now lives on beautiful Galliano Island with his family, which I'm sure has inspired um, a lot of Greenwood. And um, I just wanted to say as well, I made a little post earlier, Narielle and I use Michael's recipes um, to make our own tea today. So I use some fur um, to make my tea and feel free to join us if you guys have the ingredients at home or close by. There's um, information on the recipes on our Facebook group and also on Michael Christie's website. Um, please add any questions you would like answered in our One Book, One uh, Community Facebook event. And Narielle will be moderating throughout the event and she'll be sharing the questions with me so we can add those on as we go. Um, while we might not be able to answer all of your questions today, we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. And we'll also be sharing a recording of this conversation afterwards for those who aren't able to attend the live question. All right, Michael, are you ready to get started? I am ready. <clears throat> and thank you so much for speaking with me today. This is a pleasure. Of course. So our first question is, what sparked um, your idea or inspiration to write the book? There, I get asked this question a lot. And there's a long answer and a short answer. And I'll give you the short answer first. Um, I was cutting down a tree um, on our property here on Galliano Island to make way for a driveway. And um, it wasn't a big tree and I'm not a really experienced faller of trees. So I watched some YouTube videos and I, you know, borrowed a chainsaw and finally got the tree down. And I looked at the stump um, and in a sort of a moment of epiphany, I uh, realized that it looked sort of like a map of a narrative and uh, almost like a, a map of time itself and of, of the tree's own life. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be a really interesting way to structure a book? Um, and so I already had ideas for a number of characters for Greenwood, but they were sort of just floating around in my head. Um, and once I got that metaphor, it was I was able to really kind of <clears throat> ground everyone in the same family and the same story. And the long answer is, uh, is that I, it's a book that I've always wanted to write, and I, I really love to write about family and about our connection with the natural environment, about death, about trees themselves. And so this was a way that I could speak about things that I felt like I had something to say about. I didn't think that was too long, but that's <laughs> the short answer was longer than the long one, I think. But. <laughs> Um, all right, and our next question is um, asking about the intergenerational story. So we were wondering if you found it hard to balance the intergenerational stories with the individual ones as well. Yes, I mean, certainly when you attempt a book like this that is this complicated and has this many sort of interconnections and this many moving parts, you know, things can get out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> and things can get unbalanced very quickly. Um, and they did, you know, this, it took five years of dedicated, almost full-time writing to get the book done. And it went through, you know, numerous, numerous 
revisions and edits with editors and with my agent and with my wife, who is also a writer and my sort of first reader. Um, so yeah, it took an enormous amount of work just to try to get the, the balance right of you know, being engaged by people's personal stories and their personal time periods in each section, but then also to have the overarching narrative of the story of the family's kind of rise and fall to be a compelling one as well. And when, you know, you're writing a book like this, at one point I had Harris Greenwood burn down half of the island. Uh, and this was later in the writing of the novel so then it, I was run into a situation where I was like, okay, half of the island's now not old growth. What am I going to do? So I had to go through out every other section and change that element. And so there was a number of instances where I would change one little detail in one of the time periods and it would reverberate throughout the whole thing. So mm. it was difficult. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like a lot of work. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Um, so we do have a question from one of our members, and I'm just going to um, say exactly what they said. So they sure. were part of a different Greenwood book club, and they were wondering if you wrote the middle of the book, the part about Everett and um, his brother, and then Everett and Pod first, or did you write the other storyline central to that one? Was the way you wrote Greenwood a process that was influenced by an editor, or did you always have the format in mind? Um, when you were writing the intersecting of characters. Interesting. Yeah, I, the, the 1934 section is certainly the longest and is sort of more narratively developed, I guess, than the other sections. But I, <clears throat> I did begin with um, notes on Jake Greenwood, the 2038 section, and notes on Willow Greenwood, and notes on Everett. And that was sort of, those were the characters who kind of establish things first. Um, and then, you know, I I was also influenced by the, the, the sort of moment, the, the idea that I had for Everett was when he first found the baby um, and this kind of rough, lonely kind of, you know, cantankerous guy finding a little baby in a forest was just an, it was an image that just really spoke to me. And I, you know, I sort of drew upon my own experience as a parent. Um, and, you know, I remember the day that I, uh, my wife and I, you know, had, she, my wife had the our first son and it was a difficult pregnancy and we were sort of stuck in the hospital for a period of days in St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. And we just wanted to get out and we were just like, we just were done with this whole experience. We wanted to be at home with our new baby and, you know, it was very exciting and so, I remember the moment when my, my wife was in a wheelchair and, and someone was wheeling her out and I was carrying the baby out of the hospital for the first time out into the world. And I remember going through the threshold of the hospital and just thinking like, how come no one, why is this allowed that I get to be <laughs> in charge of this human life, this new human life? And it's almost seemed crazy that I could be put in charge uh, of this kid. And so, sorry, I, I, I drew upon that experience, my own experience as a father. And I, you know, I drew upon my experience as a brother, as a son, as a person, you know, for all of the characters in the book, I, I often write about pretty personal things in my work. And so uh, I feel like each character in Greenwood contains trace elements of myself. I'm not a parent myself, but uh -huh. just your story right now I'm sure a lot of people could relate to that of <laughs> falling along and just feeling like is this person mine right or you I think you feel unprepared because how can anyone fully prepare to be a parent and then you learn that you are I mean that you can do it and that it comes pretty naturally to you know provide care to a, a life which provides some hope for Jake moving forward yeah, I like that sort of resonance with the ending and the beginning almost where, and even in the case where the, the Greenwood boys are found near the train, there are these instances throughout the book of people being kind of rescued or being discovered and then a whole chapter of life beginning. Um, and I like that resonance with Jake 
near the end where she wasn't going to save the world, but she could care for another person. Um, and, and, and that would be a hopeful thing going forward. And that the Greenwood family line, if it can even be called that, uh, was going to continue on regardless of the devastation and the, the, the great withering. So oh, speaking of Jake, we have a question about Jake. Yeah. Um, so did you know all along that what decision Jake was going to make at the end of the book? And if so, um, why did you choose that ending? And I have a couple follow-ups to this one. Um, often writers disagree with the actions of their characters. So did you find this the case when writing Jake's ending and that storyline? Um, and also how do you see Jake's life beyond Greenwood? Great question. Um, I <laughs> I think that her actions are that make sense in the moment, and I understand that they are not um, the actions that people necessarily wanted to see. Like obviously, most readers would be at least subconsciously hoping that. Jake owns the Arboreal Cathedral in truth. This is established. She converts it to a uh, nature preserve and you know, hopefully is able to turn around the environmental devastation of the earth. But that seemed probably too easy and probably not something that if I actually had gone through with writing that ending would have felt credible or satisfying. I think often as a writer, you're looking for the ending that feels satisfying but is also surprising you 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 want to satisfy the reader on one level but also frustrate her or uh, on on another level and so that's kind of what i was going for and i think you know jake's personal journey she's a person who uh felt very rootless in her life and very kind of afloat in uh her sort of connection to her past and to her family um and she's also sort of a classic millennial in some senses. And she's got this crippling student debt. Um, she is massively overqualified for the position that she is has. She's facing a uh, an economy that is not doing her any favors. And the prospect of living a life uh, in, with any kind of dignity is basically zero. So I think, you know, it, it, it was an act of bravery on her part to leave the cathedral behind and to go forward and go out in search of a, a new way of being. Um, and then and, and part of that was the sacrifice of leaving her beloved trees behind. But I, I think that it made sense for her character and that as a writer, you're most concerned with whether you like it or not, whether you, you're most concerned with following a character on their particular journey and making sure that that journey is completed. And I feel like Jix was. Yeah. I also think it um, shows the authenticity of people as well. Like people aren't going to act in a way that you expect them to act. So yeah, I appreciated that about Jake. I, I wish her luck though. Um, right. <laughs> people often ask about what goes on, you know, after the novel and you know that's going to take five more years of work for me to know uh, as i don't i don't know what yeah. happens to jake um uh yeah um so you have mentioned that you are a parent um yes. in your experience do you think that children always rebel the lifestyle of the parents and guardians i think so i mean there, you're <laughs> referring to a particular quote in the book which is like uh the, ch the, the children of accountants become compulsive gamblers and the children of couch potatoes become marathon runners, uh, which I think is not always true necessarily, but I, I do think that rebellion is a very interesting familial force. And I've seen it in my own family. I certainly did it. And I see my son's doing it already. And I, and I, and I kind of welcome it. I think a lot of people can worry about it but I you know like my I was a pro skateboarder for a period of time and I go on the playground with my sons and I'll bring my skateboard and I'm able to do these tricks still not very well anymore because I'm old but they 
and my sons are completely unimpressed by them. Oh, uh, no. And they, they have no interest in skateboarding at all. And I really don't want to force it on them either, as I think I like the idea of them finding their own um, path and their own interests. So my, one, my son is really interested in tennis, uh, which is something that I have zero experience with. Um, so I, but I think that, that as parents and as human beings, we have to embrace these, these sort of left turns that our lives can take. And often, if you look at a family history, I think you can see these sort of um, fluctuations. You know, someone, you know, there's a timber tycoon, and of course their daughter is a environmental activist. Uh, and then of course her son is a carpenter. And I, it just felt very intuitive to me and very believable. And I think it says something about family that that is true. Um, so we, I had mentioned before that you have experience working with um, people experiencing homelessness. Did you yep. find that um, your time working with marginalized populations um, affected how you wrote um, the characters and how you approached them? For example, Everett? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that working, I worked at a emergency homeless shelter that was specifically tailored to people suffering from mental illness and uh, substance misuse at the same time. Um, so it was sort of like the most high needs population came to our shelter um, and we we're a very low barrier place. Um, and I got a job there, you know, when I was 23 and didn't really know much about homelessness or the street or drug culture or the downtown east side. This is where I was working. And so, yeah, no, it was incredibly eye-opening and, and transformative for me and my own sort of philosophies around human beings. And, you know, and it has influenced my writing in ways that I can't even probably understand quite yet. And the one thing about a homeless shelter is um, it is a place where you can go if you have a story, if you have a bad story, it is a place that will take you in. You know, we often would get people come to the homeless shelter and say, well, I was just downtown drinking with some of my buddies and I can't make it home. So can I crash here for the night kind of thing? And we would say, sorry, you gotta, you can't stay here. This place is not for you, you know? And so I ended up hearing so many just completely heartbreaking stories from people who had experienced traumas and lives that were unfathomable to me. And so, it, yeah, it, it really just made me appreciate the resilience of human beings and just the incredible strength uh, that they can display under you know, the harshest of circumstances. Mm -hmm. I, um, I was thinking a lot about Lomax's grandson or great grandson and how even after all that time somebody still cared and wanted to find out more about their family members lives and um little plug of library service we do have some genealogy resources that people can use like ancestry.ca and it's fascinating to find out information about people's lives when they might not have um, had that recognition before. I know I found information about um, my grandma and it was just really eye-opening to see a life that I never would have known about um, besides that. Um, I'm just seeing Marielle is sending me a message saying we have quite a few people saying hi on our Facebook group. Um, people are coming from Port Alice, Parksville, Gabriola and Crofton. So um, lots of people from our service area, which is great to see. Um, I, hello, everyone. <laughs> I wish I could say hello to you all individually. This is really yeah. fun. <laughs> um, what character did you find the most challenging to write? And what characters or character did you find the easiest? And also, did you feel attached? I mean, you said um, you use your own life experiences for a lot of your stories and characters. Was there anybody you felt a specific connection to? Oh, that's another great question. I, um, I mean, I think that, so a bit about myself during the writing of this book, I had two children. I lost both of my parents uh, as well 
sort of in quick succession to cancer during my mom before I started writing it, but during sort of a seven year period, I, I had two kids and lost two parents. Um, and so I was grieving, I think, in ways that I had never grieved before, but then also celebrating the lives of these two human beings who had entered the world. Um, and so I think that there's a kind of a, there's a feeling throughout Greenwood that is, um, present in sort of every character, I think. And there is this sense of being part of a chain of existence and a chain of being. And um, the traumas, the way that traumas can linger, um, the way that grief, you know, doesn't, doesn't leave you, the way that sort of like someone, I just did an interview uh, with, an, with someone in Australia and, and, it was kind of a strange interview, but in the inter interviewer opened with, uh, she was just like, you don't really like happy families, do you? Uh, <laughs> I was like, well, I don't, uh, it depends on how you define a happy family, I think. And I, you know, I'm very, I'm very interested in the ways families can misfire and uh, malfunction yet still keep going. Um, but to name some specific characters, I mean, you know, Liam Greenwood, uh, his carpentry work. I'm a. I've been. I'm a carpenter myself. I built uh, most of our our house here on the island, and I did it like in this sort of crazed period of a year, uh, and you know, nearly drove myself insane while I was doing it. And um, uh, and it, but I think part of that process for me was a kind of a grief process, and was a kind of a a way for me to focus on one project for a while and to kind of sit with myself and really come to terms with, you know, what had happened. And so um, there's, there's, there's a lot of me in him. I think there's a lot of me in Jake uh, Greenwood as well. I mean, and Everett uh, and certainly in, in Harris too. I, I have an older brother who is a, like a business guy, uh, and him and I are grew when we were growing up. We were very, very different, um, and we sort of didn't really get along, you know, as kids. But now we're extremely close, um, and so my relationship with him sort of went into the Harris Everett uh, relationship. So yeah, I mean, it's I am all over this book, and uh, it's really hard to separate to know where. I I spend this book begins. Um, somebody had just made a comment that they really like uh, your expression of families misfiring. I'm sure that's very true. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> with your other interview, people can be happy and still have a lot going on in their family dynamic. I, I'm sure most of our communities can relate to that concept. Yeah, and I, I don't know if anyone's ever been subjected to a slideshow of someone's vacation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that has gone really well. And it's the most boring thing. You know, it's the most boring possible thing. Here we are enjoying the sunset and here we are, you know, a story is about things going wrong. <laughs> and a story about a family has to have things going wrong for it to be interesting. So, uh, yeah. What a perfect analogy. I definitely experienced that. <laughs> um, oh, speaking of characters, were there any characters that you wanted to explore more but weren't able to? Or characters That's... you wanted to write but just couldn't? Yeah, I mean, I th think Jake, if I was going to critique myself, which I try not to do, but I, if I was going to, I think Jake could have been developed better. I, you know, the, it's tricky when you're writing a book like this though, because you are asking a lot of the reader to be introduced to five different time periods successively. And there's a certain amount of fatigue that can result from that structure. And so, uh, I wanted to get things going quickly and for the reader to kind of get the 
rhythm of the book and then settle into the 1934 section and kind of ride it that way. But I do think that Jake, because Jake is a fascinating character to me and I do feel like I could have explored her perhaps a little more. I mean, I have oceans of notes about her still. Um, so maybe she may be a character I would return to. Hmm. I'm not sure. Um, another character question. Uh, were any of the industrial figures based on real people like Harris Greenwood or Mr. Holt? Great question. And this is, yeah, this part, um, the sort of research, I, each time period required its own set of research. Um, the 1974 section, I, I have a good friend who was one of the founding members of uh, Greenpeace. And so I spoke to him a great deal about that, you know, sort of direct action, environmental action at that time. I did research for the renovation of high-end homes on the East Coast of, of, of America. I, you know, sort of did my best to get the most credible information for each time period. But with the 1934 section, it was the most difficult because I love that era and I love, you know, that kind of the dirty 30s depression era feel. And um, yeah, that uh, Harris Greenwood is sort of based on H.R. Uh, uh, McMillan, who I did a bunch of research uh, into and I read a bunch of his papers and, and numerous biographies and stuff. Um, certainly not, he is not a direct representation of him, um, but I, I was very fascinated by those kind of captains of industry of that period. And in, in, I grew up in Thunder Bay and there were sort of these figures, you know, C.D. Howe and James Whalen. And, you know, there are these people who sort of built these places and their names are on everything. and. I find that I found those characters fascinating, but I also knew that I, I I didn't want to portray Harris just as a kind of wicked ruiner of the earth and a sort of a mustache twisting villain. You know, I knew I needed him to be a human being as well and to be motivated by his own personal uh, struggle. And I'm, I was pretty happy with how Harris turned out. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I really liked, um, actually, Narielle and I had been chatting about Harris, and I was saying that it was nice to see the queer representation in a time that um, often writers just wouldn't include that sort of information. And it just showed us a vulnerability of Harris as well, when he's such this, like, strong figure in society, and it just, like, helped warm the character up a little bit. I like that. Yeah, and I, it was very, I mean, you know, I have tons of queer friends who are readers who read it. And at first I was a little bit like, I don't know if this is, you know, my story to tell and more my character to write, but I, you know, I, I, I feel like I worked as hard as I possibly could to avoid stereotypes and to portray a genuine love. And it, it was, it, I feel like it was almost the most romantic aspect of the novel with these two men and together and one describing the world to the other and that that sort of that that detail for me was just so moving that I I just really wanted to get it into the novel and I felt like this kind of novel you know that sort of family saga I was doing it but I was also wanting to subvert it at the same time to subvert the idea of a family and to subvert the idea that everyone throughout history has been straight. Uh, and to kind of mess with that formula uh, was a part of my project, I guess. Yeah, I um, I don't know. I'm sure other people felt like this too, the scene when um, Feeney's leaving and Harris is just in the room and thinking, calling out, thinking that he's still there. It like broke my heart a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I, my agent, uh, was like, you made me, I don't cry, but you made me cry in that Aww. part. So that was very, yeah, I was yeah. happy. Yeah. Um, so speaking of character vulnerabilities, um, mm -hmm. how do you think that this 
or their vulnerabilities helped inform their character development and relationship to the story. So um, we talked about uh, Harris and Feeney, but what about um, Everett and Pod on their journey across Canada or any other characters you can think of? Yeah, I think it's, you know, as you go, I've written three books now, which seems to me unbelievable, but I, as you go along on your journey as a writer, you kind of start to notice reoccurring patterns and themes. And I think a big one of mine is people reaching out to each other, uh, people who are vulnerable and, 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 and caring for one another in some way, uh, and maybe not in the most traditional ways, but people sort of reaching across the divide um, and seeking community or companionship or love among each other, among themselves. And so, yeah, that, you know, the Everett and the baby, you know, that, that initial image came to me and I, uh, I just found it so moving and the idea that he would want to be rid of it at first and yet despite himself would grow to love it. And then, uh, are we in spoiler? Territory is a spoiler, okay the or no? Love is finished. Um, okay. So I'm assuming everybody who is watching has okay. And then I guess I can say maybe I can say it without giving away. But what uh, the the sacrifice that Everett eventually makes for the child? Not only does he come to love it, he goes beyond, and you know is willing to give up an enormous thing for the child's well being. I just I found that. Uh, to be a very moving and and sort of fitting seeming expression of Everett's love for the child. Um, and, you know, throughout the book, there are, you know, people who are vulnerable, even, you know, someone like Lomax, who is, uh, could be, you know, sort of conceived of as the villain, I guess, of this novel, but is is not, and is, you know, a man struggling with his own demons and his own dysfunction his own family legacy that is uh you know difficult and so i love i mean the reason that i read is to feel people's vulnerabilities you know you you look at instagram and you see everyone so happy and nobody has any problem and you know it's all just wonderful and you know these bright shining lives but i i love the fact that in fiction you can see beneath that layer and you can go into someone's bedroom and hear them say the most sort of the saddest possible thing and to reveal themselves in the most intimate way. And that's, for me, that is why I read. I love to know other people on a deeper level. Um, so a lot of our book club members had mentioned imagery as being a huge part or a huge draw to the book. Um, with some members even rereading or re-listening to the book or certain sections in order to relish in it just a little bit longer. It seems like our members just couldn't get enough of it, which is um, definitely huge praise to you. Um, and I would imagine that the predominant readership, especially those living on the West Coast, already has a, had a closeness or a transcendence to Greenwood and the forest. Um, how do you think that the experiences of readers differ from elsewhere in Canada or the world? when they don't have that innate connection to the land and forest. And just before this, we were chatting briefly about the fact that we're both from Ontario and I found I've been more drawn to reading about like lands and forests and stuff since I've moved to BC a few years ago. Um, and I found the same thing reading Greenwood is the imagery just like, yeah, it really makes you appreciate where we all thankfully like, get to live. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting. It's been surprising, I guess, to me that you know, I know I knew when I was when I began this book, I knew about my own personal connection to forests and 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 to wood and to wooden objects and to forestry. Even I mean, my family uh, was involved in the forestry industry in uh, Thunder Bay. There's a pulp and paper mill there, you know, so. It, trees, forests, wood have, have been woven through my life, you know, in, 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 in impossible to separate ways. And so I knew about my own connection and my own sort of 
salvation that I have found here in these West Coast forests and here on Galliano Island where I live now, I mean, moving here was just a completely transformative thing for me and to be among trees like these and to get to just go out and walk through them, you know, I've found creatively just incredibly inspiring. Um, and then also just personally too, it's just, I, it's a place I love. And so, but I was very surprised by people's reaction to this book. Like, I mean, it's, it's sold in a bunch of countries. I just got an email today that it's going to be published in China. Uh, and so it's not just the familiarity, I think, with forests, not that there aren't forests in China, but there, you know, it's been incredible to me and surprising. And I think it's just that people and human beings and trees have a fundamental connection with each other. And I don't know, I don't understand it. I don't know where it comes from, but it is undeniable and it, it's a powerful connection. And I think that this book taps into that connection and sort of seeks to understand it on some level. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I, it's, it's, it's great that my own personal obsession with forests and trees has translated to other people, you know, enjoying to read about them as well. And that is, as an author, that is, you know, all you can ever hope for. And would you say you have a like very impactful memory involving trees besides the origin of um, yeah, cutting one down. I, yeah, I killed one. Uh, no. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, as a kid, I would be, there was a forest kind of behind my house and my, you know, brother and I would be back there building forts and, you know, off, this was the seventies. So, or the early eighties. So we were off on our own for hours at a time, you know, in those forests. And, uh, and then also, yeah, my own carpentry experience. I mean, I've spent hour upon hour staring at the grain of wood and you know trying to finish things just right and you know trying to get all my window frames to to, to line up all the trim to you know meet perfectly and so I think you know that those experiences um and then also just my experience as a person living on this land and in this place that is so full of trees this country that we live in that um that all went into the the novel in in some way and um in your book kit for greenwood and i think yep. just, um previous interviews you've had you've talked a lot about the impact of environmentalism and yep. um it, it's been established that you and our readers have a huge connection to trees and forests but i think environmentalism goes beyond that because it's about the preservation afterwards. Do you have um, any memories that solidified your connection to environmentalism? I mean, one very harrowing uh, fact is that the on Galliano Island where I live, the uh, many of the Western red cedars um, uh, here are certainly the ones that are more exposed, like that are closer to roads or clearings uh, are dying and withering and browning, their needles are browning and they're dying. And there's some debate uh, around why this is happening, but many people believe um, that it's due to drought stress, repeated drought stress because of climate change. Um, and that uh, the trees are just not able to deal with extreme dry and extreme wet periods. Um, and so there is a, you know, people are always saying, you know, have said to me, you know, the great withering, oh, wow, what a, you know, what a deranged mind that, you know, you must have to come up with something as, <laughs> as horrible as that. Uh, yeah. But it's not, it really didn't require much imagination, I'm sorry to report, and that, you know, trees seem so resilient, and they seem so powerful, and they live for so long, and they reach so high, but they're actually finely tuned to their particular, not only their climate zone, but their microclimate zone, where they are, what species are around them, where their you know, sun is coming from. All of those factors are built into the growth of a tree and the sort of experience of a tree. And if 
any of those factors are altered, trees are actually very vulnerable uh, and much more vulnerable than we think they are. So it's thoughts of my own children going forward and living in a world where more trees are withering and dying, where cl the climate is being altered in a way that you know, means that our lives are going to be significantly imp impacted is terrifying to me. And I, you know, hope that I don't think fiction is going to change the world. I think that political action is going to, but I, it's, it's what I want to read about and it's what I want to think about. And I, I think that I, this novel was a way for me to speak about the human being's relationship with the environment and with the natural world over time um, with the hopes that people will consider their own relationship and consider how symbiotically they live with the natural world uh, while they're reading. That's good. Um, so as I was mentioning in my introduction, you have quite a number of accomplishments as uh, an author, <laughs> winning international and national awards. Um, do you find that your approach to writing changed after writing If I Fall, If I Die and The Beggar's Garden? Each time I feel each time I complete a book, I always rush and start another book sort of right away uh, <laughs> in, with the idea that this time I know what I'm doing. I've perfected <laughs> I'm an expert. I know, you know, I, this, the next time I do this is going to be easy and I start the book and then it sort of flatlines after about five weeks. It just dies on my desk and I'm forced to abandon it. And um, I think the one thing that I've learned is that you are a perpetual amateur, I think in, in this, in, in writing. And it's something that people, have trouble embracing because um, it's scary. It's a scary state to be in to sort of, you know, to wager my entire future on the fact that I'm going to be able to write another novel. I don't know if I will be able to. And I have I have a friend actually on the island who's a carpenter and he builds houses. And we were having a beer one time and he kind of looked at me and he said, so you're telling me that you spend five years making this thing that may be worthless <laughs> in the end. It could be, you know, no one could buy it. No publisher could want it. And I was like, yeah, I guess I guess I do do that. Uh, I was like, wow, I could not possibly take that risk. Um, and it's a scary thing to do. So uh, with all that said, I feel like this next book, I really, it's gonna be easy. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, no, I, I, it's it's a it's a really fun and uh, uncertain thing to do, but I, I I've had many other jobs, and being a writer is uh, by far the most um, befitting of my my character. Hmm. Um. So, what can we expect um, in the future from you then, if you're um. You said your next book is that yeah that I, in the works. Uh, the one thing I'm working on now is um, I just like sold the rights for the for Greenwood to a sort of a Hollywood production company. Like a producer has bought it, um, and he's done like Six Feet Under and Westworld and stuff previously so it's very he's great and really brilliant guy and so um i've been working a little bit on the idea of adapting it to episodic like limited series tv um it's like 10 episodes sort of thing so that it may never happen no promises anyone don't <laughs> don't uh, get too excited but i've been working on that recently and that's been very interesting and different uh, than writing um, just straight fiction. Um, That's exciting because you can go back to characters too. You can relive your experiences with them. True. And there's been a lot of discussion around how the tree ring structure could be translated to the screen, if it can be, how we're going to sort of 
um, construct the narrative so that it's not jarring and so that it works uh, visually. But so that's, yeah, that's been interesting. But I do have, and I have, I've, I have an idea though for a new novel and it's um, set on a small island. Uh, and I, it's feeling, it's feeling pretty, pretty good, pretty viable so far. So, uh, but that's, per, that's all I can say. That's good. Yeah. I'm just going to leave a little bit of time in case we have any more questions coming in through our Facebook group. Um, again, we just have had uh, quite a few people saying where they're um, tuning in from. So we have, uh, in addition to what I was mentioning before, Nanaimo, Protection Island, um, Port McNeil, Park Sill. Um, so again, we're reaching quite a bit of Vancouver Island and our service areas. So that's really great to see. Um, that's so, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to thank you again so much um, for joining us for our author visit to you, um, Mike, and also for all of our viewers today. We've heard such positive and powerful feedback from Greenwood. Um, and I just wanted to make a little mention that we are starting three additional book clubs. Um, so Greenwood is wrapping up today and we're going to be doing our prize draw for your um, top 10 ecofiction recommendations. We have a book prize bundle that's going to be announced later today. Um, but our three new virtual book clubs um, we have they're starting tomorrow. The book club Facebook groups are open right now, but um, the books will become available on either Overdrive or Libby or RB Digital um, with no holds tomorrow. So we have our shared shelf. That's one for children and families. We have Take a Break, which is for people seeking lighthearted or informative reads. Um, we have Books and Beyond, which is a book club to explore community action topics and then um, follow up activities. And you can find all of this information on our Greenwood one book, one community Facebook page, and also um, on our website at viral.bc.ca. Um, we're also going to be launching our adult summer reading challenge shortly. So just check back on our website again, viral.bc.ca for um, further information about that. Um, and I'm just seeing as well, we've had some comments coming in, just thanking you from our community um, for creating Greenwood and um, joining us for today. Thank you. And thanks for your great questions. That was a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Good. Well, um, thank you everybody for joining us. I think we'll end there. Great.